Well, this morning we're talking about uh, seeker or seeker friendly. And there is a difference. So we're going to open our Bibles to Romans chapter 3. And we're going to look at a couple of verses here to start with Romans 3 and Hebrews 11. And a, f- a few years ago, uh, actually probably a generation ago now, there was a, a movement, and it was about the seeker-friendly churches. Anybody remember the, that phrase, seeker-friendly? And I, th- I think seeker-friendly kind of meant that, at least my interpretation of it and what I'd learned about it was... Um, we don't have enough gospel to offend anybody. Everybody can get along here. Everybody can just feel comfortable here because we're not telling the truth. We're not telling you what the gospel is straight up, that Christ died for our sins. Why would Christ die for our sins? Because we are sinners. A lot of people don't want to know that. But anyway... Uh, in Romans chapter 3, verse 11, it says, There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. And so if you were a truly a seeker-friendly church, there would be no one there. Because the scripture says there's no one seeking after God. Okay, now let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11... And verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Glory to God. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Father, I pray that that somehow, Lord, uh, out of what we say this morning, there would be an inspiration in our hearts, Lord, to seek you out and to know you for who you really are. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So are these, are these, uh, are these verses uh, contradicting each other? The scripture says, and that was a quote from Isaiah, there's none who seeks after God. And then the New Testament it says... Uh, we have to believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So there are some people who seek God. But the exhortation or the commandment to seek God is given to people who have been enlightened. I know one of the, one of the most solid things I heard for years was when John Haruska told us he, was, he used to work out at Beale Air Force Base and he's working out there in a construction crew and and uh, there's various people out there with various backgrounds, various experiences with church or without church or whatever. And uh, there was a guy there who was not saved, and, and he had apparently been beat up with the Bible a few times. And John told him, that Bible isn't even written to you. This, this book is not, if you're an unbeliever, this book isn't even written to you. This is God's message to God's people, okay? So when we become enlightened, he said, then now start seeking me. Well, I thought I already found you, you know? 45 years ago, there was the I found it campaign was trending. You saw the bumper stickers. I found it. What did you find? I found Jesus. Well, I didn't really find him. He found me. But... That was the, once you come to Christ, really the only thing that has changed is what? My destiny. I walked into the latrine at Beale Air Force Base. I was, I was on the fast track to the lake of fire. And I came out the door on my way to heaven with my sins forgiven. That fast. I said, yes, Lord. And that, that was it. Okay? But... I didn't, still, I didn't know anything about God. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know what his expectations were of me. I, I didn't know anything. And I could have ended up anywhere. I could have ended up in any church in this town. 
I could have ended up in a Mormon church, a Jehovah's Witness church. I could have ended up in a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, and everything else that's around. I could have ended up anywhere because I didn't know anything. And the first Christian I met brought me here. I got blessed. I, got to, I, I still get to be here after almost 50 years. Praise the Lord. So God's, God's command it, to seek him is given to people that have been enlightened. Now that your light is on, seek me out for who I am. So uh, from, the, from the dictionary here, the word seek in Hebrew, the Strong's Concordance, it means to search out by any method. In Greek, it means, and Greek would be the original language of the New Testament, in Greek it means to seek to find. Although Strong's gives more meanings and elaboration, the core meaning of the word seek supports God's desire to be found. If you read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, it says that God's eternal purpose is to reveal himself, to be found, to be known. Paul said that I might know him. This is the Apostle Paul who had a light shine in his face. It was so bright, it was brighter than the sun. It blinded him, knocked him off his horse. He heard the audible voice of God giving him instructions. Three days later, he... Hands are laid on him. He receives his sight. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He, he's, he's been literally all over his world of that day as a missionary. He's preached the gospel. He's healed the sick. He's raised up lame people. He's raised the dead. And now he's in prison. And he's writing to the, to the church at Philippi. And he says that I might know him. After all those experiences... What was he still wanting? He was still wanting to know God more. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection, even in the fellowship of his suffering. If I could just know him. Moses, Moses was at the burning bush. The voice of God spoke to him out of that burning bush and said, here's what I want you to do. He goes to the Pharaoh, short story. They have 10 plagues that happened miraculous plagues, and then they have a miraculous deliverance of the whole nation of Israel out of Egypt, over two million people. He waves a stick over the Red Sea, and it opens up, and they go across on dry ground. The same sea that opened up for them swallows up the Egyptian army and kills them all. They get manna from heaven in the desert. They get quail to eat. They get water out of a rock. Not once, but twice. They get water out of a rock. And then, you know, Moses goes up the mountain. He hears the voice of God. He gets the Ten Commandments on the tablets. And you know what he says after that? Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Yeah, God, I've seen all the stuff that you can do, but I want to know who you are. There's a difference. You can sit in this church for 50 years and see all the stuff that God can do. You can watch the Leland Parises come through here. You can watch the Curtis Mays come through here. You can watch the Gary Whiteleys come through here. You can watch all these people that have had supernatural, miraculous uh, God encounters, life-changing experiences, and you can watch all that God can do and sit here for 50 years and never really know him any more than you did the first day you got here. That's not God's plan. He said... Seek me. God has a desire to be found. Okay? In the Bible, the word seek means to search for something hidden. How many people have ever... Now, I won't ask that, but I'll just, just, just tell you. A lot of people have a claim to fame that I've read the Bible cover to cover, front to back. I've read the Bible a couple of times from front to back. But you know, that's not really how it was designed to be read. It's, it's not a book that's uh, chronological. It's, most of it's not chronological. It's, it's not a book that you read a continuing story all the way through. God has set it up. He said, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. He has hidden his wisdom from the wise. You read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God has hidden 
his wisdom from the smart people. Not, not the people that we call smart, the people that call themselves smart. Okay? I know some really smart people, but that's not what I'm talking about. The people who call themselves smart, the wise of this world, God has hidden it. You can't just open it and, and read it from front to back. That's not how it was designed to be written, uh, read. God has hidden himself, and he wants us to seek him out. Amen? He wants us to seek him out. Okay? If you really want to shake up your world, and this is, this is really the, the core of what I'm trying to bring us this morning, is if you want to shake up your world, and you know, some people don't want their world shaken up. I was talking to some brothers Friday morning. I said, you know, there's, there's two, there, there's a lot more than two, but there's at least two immutable truths that you can never get away from. And one is that people will not change until the pain of staying the same outweighs the desire to change and be different. And the other immutable truth is if you pour everything you have into anything, you will have nothing. Or my Oliver's interpretation of that is if it takes everything you have to float somebody else's boat, you're all going to sink because there's never going to be enough. Okay. John Wayne said it like this. If you find somebody who's in trouble and you help them out, they'll always find you again next time they're in trouble. In other words, there's no end to it. Okay. So if you really want to shake up your world in here, this world that I live in, I don't, I don't want to just be a religious person. I don't want Sunday to be my, my thing that I do because it's Sunday I want, to, I want to know him. I want to know who God is. With it, start seeking your God encounter. And you can't really make it happen. That's kind of the, the catch-22 of it. You can, you can set up the opportunities, but God will, he will not disappoint you. I, re, I remember, I've had a few God encounters along the way, and, the, and if, if you have a real God encounter, it'll last you a long time. It will last you a long time. How old were you when you went to heaven, Ron? 20? And you're knocking on 70, 69, right, like me, right? Okay. <laughs> so 49 years ago, he had a God encounter. God took him to the world of heaven and walked with him and talked with him and told him a bunch of things. And it's lasted him. He's had a few other encounters since then. I had a God encounter in the restroom at Beale Air Force Base in the, in, in the barracks. Back in probably the mid to early 80s, I was, I was seeking God for my Bible school lessons. I was teaching at, at New Life Bible College, and I felt the Lord just leading me into the sanctuary. I came in here, it was dark. And we had this part of the room and that part of the room. This wing wasn't built yet, so there was a wall right there where those uh, columns are. And I walked in here, and the closer I got to the altar, the harder it was to stand up. Because there was a weight and a pressure just pushing me down. And before I got to the altar, I was on my face on the rug. And I saw a little glimpse of the glory of God. I saw a light. I had my face in the rug and my hands covering my, the rest of my face like this. And the light was so intense and so bright that it, it burned right through. I couldn't, I couldn't not see it. I don't know if you've ever at night, maybe when you're a kid or maybe you still do it, play with your flashlights. I got a grandson that loves flashlights. But if, you, if, you if you're in a dark room and you put that flashlight under your hand, if it's very bright, you'll be able to see the outline of your bones, kind of like a, a miniature little x-ray. And that's what happened. That light was so bright, it went right through my skull into my, my seeing. I, my eyes were closed, but it was so bright. And I saw the glory of his grace. And when I got up and went, made my way to the classroom to teach, I, I was so weak, I couldn't, 
really even stand up. I barely made it into the classroom, and I was hanging on the pulpit like this, and I couldn't talk. And the five or six students, seven students, whatever they were, that were in the class, they are just, I was the last class of the evening, too. So they're just looking at me. And they don't know what just happened to me. And I, I was only at the, at the podium for a, a little bit, and then I'm, I remember I slid down to the, it was pretty embarrassing, I slid down to the floor because I had no strength. And then when I finally got my wits about me, they were all gone. And no one ever said anything to me about that. None of those, none of those students in that class ever said, hey, man, what happened to you? You know? So like 30 years later, maybe longer, 30, 35 years later, Paul Tuttle and I are meeting at church here every Sunday morning uh, at 7 o'clock. We're meeting here. To, to have prayer time together. And so after our prayer, we go out and make coffee, and we're standing there looking out in the parking lot. And, and I said, I looked down the hallway, and I said, hey, you remember when? He said, yes. <laughs> we're talking 35 years later. I didn't even tell him what I was going to say. And he knew. And I said, you remember that? And he goes, oh, yeah. I said, what do you think about that? He goes, I didn't know what to think about that. But I'm telling you, I, th- that, that lasted me a long time. I got, I, when I finally got in my car to go home, it was a miracle. Because I didn't even have enough strength in me to push the gas pedal. And anybody who's ever ridden with me knows I have a lot of strength to pull the gas, push the gas pedal. <laughs> but I drove home, I think, at an idle all the way home. And it was two or three days before I could get my voice above a whisper. Because a God encounter will alter you. It will change you. It will will shake up your world. And if you will walk in a God encounter for very long, it will shake up the world of the people around you. In Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read you some verses out of there. And there's so many of them, that's why I didn't have them put on the screen. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is giving us his nuggets of wisdom. And he's saying, uh, you know, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. He says, keep a single eye for the things of God. No one can serve two masters. And then verse 25, he says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you're going to put on. Is not life more than food, and the body is more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't worry, and God takes care of them. Verse 27, which of you by worry can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Look at the flowers of the field. God takes care of them. Verse 30, now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry. Don't worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What shall we wear? I never worry about what I'm going to wear. My wife tells me what to wear. She dresses me. Didn't she do a good job? She dressed me. Don't worry about that. For after all these things, verse 32, the Gentiles, that would be the unbelievers. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. There's no shortage of things for us to seek after in this life. It's everywhere. There's always something to seek after. We have, first we have our necessities, what he just talked about here. All the necessities, that, things that we have to have. I remember, I hadn't been saved very long, and Pastor Hood was our pastor, him and Sister Hood, and, and it came around to be Christmas time, and so some of the people met and trying to decide, what are we, what's the church going to, what, what gift are we going to get pastor for Christmas? And somebody said, they need a new television. And my first thought was, When did television become a need? 
They, you need food, right? You need shelter. You need clothing. You pretty much need a vehicle. There are certain things, yeah, we do need. These necessities of life can often cause us to worry, especially if we're looking at, at today or the day ahead or the weeks ahead, and we see a shortage coming of something that is our necessities. Our car breaks down or, or anything like that. We lose our job. We, and the necessities, we see them start to run out. We can start worrying. But if you belong to God, if you've ever walked in a God encounter, you're just going to say, I'm trusting God. I, I've made it this far. I haven't missed a meal. I'm telling you, I've been unemployed. I worked in construction. I worked in construction, and some of you are old enough to remember this. In 19... 80 or 81, interest rates went to 20%. I mean, you, you walked off the job one day, and you're going back the next day, and they said, nope. And you look at whole housing tracks. I bet Fred remembers this. Whole housing tracks where there was slabs poured, forms set for new slabs, some had walls partially framed up. Some of them had walls all framed up with uh, trusses on top. Some of them had truss packages just laying on top. And everything came to a screeching halt. Everything. They said, we're not finishing one more house unless it sells. We're not putting out another dime because we, we can't sell these things at 20% interest. And times got tough. Times got tough. You know what? I didn't miss any meals. I didn't eat steak every night, but we didn't miss any meals. God was always faithful. I mean, at some point along in there, my wife and I prayed on a Friday morning. We were at the, at the kitchen table, and we prayed for work. And as, I mean, as soon as we said amen, the phone rang, and it was her Uncle Jack. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm praying for a job. He goes, I got one for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh, brother. He's, he's, all his work is in Sacramento and Orangevale and Davis. And I don't know, how am I going to drive to work until paydays, you know, for gas? And I didn't even get a chance to say that. He said, I got a guy working for me that lives right there in Oliver's. He's going to pick you up Monday morning. God's good. I tell you, if you, if you, if you start having God encounters and you start living out of that, you, you, it takes away a lot of the worries about your necessities because you can trust him. The psalmist said, I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. How could, how, where does he get the confidence to say that? Because he's had God encounters and he walked in them. And he trusted God. Okay? We have other things that, that we desire besides our necessities. We desire our leisure and entertainment. Leland Paris's dad was a, a scientist and a, a genius among geniuses, I would imagine. And... Not, not a believer at, at the time that he told Lee this. He said, leisure will be the downfall of America. Now, there's some insight right there. Leisure will be the downfall of America. Why? Because when I'm living for leisure, it, it's all about I, no more productivity. I'm not producing anything. I'm not creating anything. All I'm trying to do is get my paycheck so I can go spend it on my leisure. And then the focus is all on me and my leisure, and there's no more creativity. There's no more ma major production things going on in my life. And when that happens to a whole society, we're going to collapse. That's how it goes. None of these things are going to light up my world. Even if you get the necessities that are at the top of the line. 
You get the fanciest car, the fanciest home, the fanciest everything that's on the necessity list. That's not going to light you up. It's going to wear out. It's going to get old. It's going to get rusty or it's going to burn up. It's not going to light up your life. And leisure and entertainment. I just spoke to someone. I can't remember who it was now. They might be in here. They might not be in here. But somebody just told us the other day that they went to a 49ers game. First time they'd ever been to a 49ers game. And you know what they said right after that? I'll probably never do it again. It's something to look forward to. It's something that this is going to light up my life, man. And then you go do it and you say, well, that was a bust. No refrigerator, no recliner, no bathroom 20 feet away. <laughs> no heater, no air conditioner, you know, all that stuff. Hey, all the things that we think are going to light up our life, they're all, they're all temporary. They're all rusty. They're not going to last, and it's not going to work. Most people are on a search for something that's going to light up their life. And I'm going to tell you, the thing that's going to light up your life and last is a God encounter. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians here probably till we get done. Let's see, where are we? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That's page uh, 1498, if you have a really cool Bible, okay? <laughs> Any Bible will do, even the one on your phone, okay? Somebody was uh, talking about the various translations. There's some people who like to argue about the translations. And the most people who argue about translations of the Bible are the King James only people. And I'm, I'm a King Jameser. I was raised on it. I'm a new King James now. But um, I remember Gary Whiteley said one time that people were arguing about the different translations of the Bible. And Gary said, There's, God put enough gospel in all of them so anybody can get saved. So don't worry about that. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with an unveiled face, an open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. From glory to glory, from experience to experience, from God encounter to God encounter to God encounter, if, if I would never have a God encounter since I got saved, I probably wouldn't be standing right here. I don't know what I would be doing, but I wouldn't be much different than I had ever been. Because head knowledge, you could study the scriptures and get all this head stuff going, but head knowledge is not what transforms my life. What transforms my life is a God encounter. That's what transforms me. That's what fires my rocket. That's what changes me. That's what alters me. I think I have a sermon somewhere in my vault about being altered at the altar. That's what will change us, is the God encounter. We behold the glory of the Lord. We, we look into the face of God. Look at chapter 4, verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, the King James says hidden, I like that a little better, even if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. When the glory of Christ shines on a person, they're altered, they're changed. Let's see, verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God, this is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light. Uh, I hope you can memorize this verse. 
Burn it into your mind and your spirit. Write, write it down on three by five cards and tape it up in ten places around your house and in your car. It's God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When you have a God encounter, you're going you're, you're gonna to be changed. The, the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is only found in a God encounter. It's found in the face of Jesus, coming face to face with Jesus. I don't mean face to face like you see me and I see you. But there's a, there's a God encounter. There's a face to face encounter that, that changes a person forever. Forever. In chapter 4, verse, three, uh, verse 17, Paul said, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He is, he is working something inside of us. It's, I wrote in my, my margin here, substance. Something of, 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 of weight and value he's forming inside of us. While we do not look at the things that are seen, are, are you living only for things that you can see? Only for the things on the necessity list and the leisure and entertainment list? Is, is that what you live for? If that's the focus of your life, you're missing the whole point of being a Christian. While we do not look at things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, how do you look at something that's not seen? How, how can you look at something and see something that's invisible? Well, we're going to get there in a second. For the things which are seen are temporary or temporal. Everything that you see here is is going to be burned up. Pastor John was bringing us a verse quite regularly for a while, and it's in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it says, Seeing then that all these things shall be burned up, or melt with a fervent heat. Is that how it goes? Seeing that all these things are going to melt with a fervent heat, what manner of people ought we to be? All this stuff is going to disappear. It's going to go up in the big fire. My, I helped my boss, Gary Hunter, and I, uh, he built a house, and I was his only employee. So we built this house in Yuba City, and um, it was for a, a highway patrol uh, officer uh, who worked out of the Williams office. And just before they moved in, that house won the Yuba Sutter Builders and Developers Home Show first place. And him and his wife came in, and I was putting the finishing touches on a couple things, and they were just oohing and on over this house. And I said, yep, it's pretty, pretty nice kindling for the big fire. And they're like, what? You know, they thought I was going to burn their house down or something. I said, no. I said, this whole world is headed for the big fire. You know, when I was younger, I was, when I met people, I was like, I'd give you Genesis to Revelation, heavy on Revelation and the lake of fire. Um, I've mellowed a little bit since then, sometimes. But in, in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, and I didn't put the ver, uh, scripture reference, but that's the next bullet point there on your, if you've got a paper. It says, by faith, Moses, when he came, became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And if you know the story of Moses, he was born to a Hebrew uh, mother and the command was to kill all the male babies. And they saw how handsome of a baby he was. They hid him out for three months. When they couldn't hide him anymore, uh, they put him out in a basket. Pharaoh's daughter came down to, to the river to bathe. And she saw the baby. She took it home, raised it as her own. And he became second in line to the Pharaoh of Egypt. But he's a Hebrew. And so when he came of age and he understood who he was and what his heritage was, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. 
He valued a God encounter more than all the treasures of Egypt, which is what he could have inherited. It says, for he looked to the reward. He looked to the reward. What does that mean, look to the reward? He looked at what it meant, what was the end of getting all of these treasures of Egypt and all the power. It would be like the rich young ruler that Jesus dealt with. He was rich. He had everything. He had wealth. He was young, so he had a, he has wealth, and he had his youth, and he had power because it says he was a ruler. I mean, that's all. He's got it all. And he came to Jesus and said, what am I missing? The power trip isn't getting it done. The wealth isn't getting it done. All the things I can do with my youth is not getting it done. What am I missing? You're missing a God encounter. Jesus said, well, you know, keep the commandments. And the guy goes, which ones? There's typical human. What's the least I can get by with? Which ones? And the, the, the commandments are divided into two categories. One is towards people. And one, is toward, one category is towards God. And so Jesus addressed him with the human ones. Honor your father and mother. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't be immoral. He, oh, I've done all that. What am I still missing? Well, he didn't get to the don't have any other gods before me. Because his power and his wealth and his youth, that's what he was worshiping. And it wasn't getting the job done. It just, it, it, he was living for what you can see. And it says that Moses looked at the end of all that and said, there is an end to it. <laughs> there is an end. He's looked at the end and said, it's death. It says he looked to the reward. So then he looked this way and he looked toward seeking after God and he said the reward, the end of that, there is no end. It's eternal life. It's life here and it's eternal life after this. Regardless of what you have to put up with to get there. We got it pretty easy in America. A lot of countries, Christians are being persecuted. It's probably coming here before long. Christians are being persecuted around the world. They're being imprisoned. They're being iced out of jobs. You know, some places it's, it's as mild as we don't want you working for us because you're a Christian. And other places, they, they seek them out to kill them. And everything in between. We've got it pretty easy here. But look to the end. Look to the end. I heard a preacher named Bob Gass one time. He said, so much of America and even Christians are trading in eternal life for what they think is 70 years of max comfort. Living for this. Well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus died for my sins, but I'm living for this. I'm not, I don't seek God. Why would I seek a God encounter? I got all this. Because a God encounter is the only thing that's going to propel, propel you into eternal life. Acts 17 so that they should seek the Lord and hope that, he might grope, that they might grope for him and find him. Though he's not far, he's not far from any one of us right now. He's, he's here. Colossians 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, not here. You know, I'll, I'll be I'll truthful. My wife and I have never been people to seek here, the stuff that's here. We've lived for Jesus and for our kids, for the church. And I drove here in my own rig and she drove here in her own rig and she's got her own parking place out there. <laughs> I, got to, I got to build my own house and I wasn't even trying to. That wasn't what I was living for. In fact, some of the time I was building my house, I was feeling guilty, like, man, am I loving the world or what? Lee was helping me one day, and he goes, brother, he goes, this is just a tool for the ministry. I said, okay. And it's the tool. It's where we raised our kids. 
But that's not what we've lived for. If you are raised with Christ, if you're born again, seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. You've got to get all in. You can't be, have one foot in and one foot out. I think it was one of the, probably the second sermon that pastor preached from this pulpit. And he talked about the lion are you on the line? There is no line. Talked about real estate. You know, where you look at the plot on paper and the plots are defined by lines on a paper. But out there, there's no line. You're either on this property or you're on this property. There's not even a fence that makes a line. There's no line. Search for me with all your heart. Isaiah 55 Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. There's coming a day when the door will close. We are in something that most people don't even think about. Even Christians, we don't think about. We're, this is the dispensation of grace. This is the dispensation when God is dealing with humans through the mercy of his Holy Spirit, wooing us, calling us to repentance. This is the dispensation where we can seek a God encounter and meet him and be changed. And the Bible says, when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first and those of us who are alive and remain are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, all hell is going to be unleashed literally on this planet. Two of my close friends had visions. One of them said, man, I saw, I, I heard that trumpet sound. I saw people going up and I saw rockets coming down. Another one said, I saw the people disappearing and all of a sudden there was bloodshed in every house. People just killing each other, going crazy. After the rapture of the church, when the door is shut, there's going to be seven years, period, where half of the people in the world will die. Half. You read the book of Revelation, chapter 6 to 19. Half the people in the world are going to die in less than a seven-year period. There are going to be so many dead people, there won't be enough live people to do the burying. And out of all those dead, stinking corpses is going to come pestilence and diseases and all kinds of stuff that's going to afflict all the people that are left. And there's not going to be a Holy Spirit to call upon. It's a, it'll be a different dispensation. It will not be the dispensation of grace where whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not like that. There will be people that will probably be saved out of the great tribulation, but it's not going to be like you think. Okay? Matthew 25, Jesus said, he gave a little story about the ten virgins. He said, they, they, they all are a spouse to the bridegroom. And while he delayed his coming, they all went to sleep. But five were wise and kept oil in their lamps because you don't know what hour he's coming. And five were foolish and let the oil oil symbolic of the Holy Spirit, let the oil run out of their lamp, their vessel. At midnight, the cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. And they all rose up and trimmed their lamps, and the ones that were wise had light to see to go in. And those who were foolish said, We don't have any oil. Give us some of yours. They said, No time. Go get your own. And by the time they could go get their own oil and fill their lamp and come back, the door was shut. Seek the Lord while he may be found. So, Luke 11, 9 to 13, and I'm not going to take time to read that this morning. It's the sole purpose of our 11 o'clock hour, which is going to happen in a few minutes. The purpose of our 11 o'clock hour is not just to listen to good music or sing songs. It is to spend our time Asking, seeking, and knocking 
on God's door. Start by saying, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you that you were able to walk in these doors today and come to a place where you have an opportunity to have a God encounter, where you have an opportunity to seek him out. Starting it right here this morning is what's going to propel you through the week to spend the rest of your days of the week seeking after him. Seek him while he may be found. And he can be found this morning in our worship service. That's, that's why we set aside a whole service just for worship. So that we can come before the throne of God and we can knock and we can seek and we can ask. Oh God, I just want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you. God, thank you that my sins are forgiven. I just want to know you. And that when you start your worship like that, you, you're headed for a God encounter. Amen. Amen.